Well, thank you everyone for coming along to the Queen View and Sewage Triven Plan upgrade design presentation tonight. Um, I always like to share at the start of our project meetings, I guess the vision and mission of the project that the project team developed um, when the uh, concept design phase kicked off. And that is for us to deliver a robust, reliable and sustainable sewage treatment plant that protects public health and the environment for future generations. Um, as mentioned earlier, this is a recorded session. Um, the presentation and discussion will be recorded. Um, if anyone would like to ask any questions um, that are unrecorded, we can do that at the end of the presentation and we'll let you know when the recording has stopped. Um, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Queen Bin Palarang area and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge the stories, traditions and living cultures of our First Nations peoples on this land and commit to building a brighter future together. Um, so the presenters tonight are myself, Simon Bolton, QPRC's uh, project manager for the project. I'm a civil engineer who has an interest in delivering public infrastructure projects. I love the challenges of dealing with all the stakeholders and hope that we can at the end of the project achieve an outcome where everyone feels like their their thoughts have been considered in the project and it's been a beneficial outcome for everyone david yeah hello everyone my name is dr david perry um, i'm a process engineer by training uh, with a, a phd in wastewater treatment i'm very passionate about treating people's wastewater and sewage someone needs to be um, and the reason I am is because I, I guess I grew up, you know, on a farm. I, I really value as a, as a, from, you know, early childhood, the, the value of water. You see the value of water and you appreciate it as a resource. And I also enjoy, like, in terms of recreation, the, the beautiful amenities that, that river systems give us. I love swimming in rivers. So taking that passion, um, you know, really drove me towards, you know, using my, my, my skills in engineering to, um, to, 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 to try and, treat our, our wastewater the best we can. And I've worked for about 15 years in, in the wastewater industry in Australia. And what I'll say to you um, is that it's always a balance. And what we try to do as a, as a designer is we're balancing, um, you know, outcomes for the environment and for sustainability against how much that's going to cost people, you know, because, you know, we all pay rates. And so it's, it's finding... Where, where is that good value point that's, that's reasonable, you know, affordable for, for the communities, um, uh, but, but is also providing benefit. And so we've really, uh, really tried to apply that thinking in the way that we've approached this Queen Bin upgrade. But thank you um, again for, for taking interest in something that's very passionate um, and of interest to me. So, Simon? Uh, so tonight's presentation, we'll we'll give a, a quick overview of the project, just so everyone's on the same page of, of what it's um, where the background is. Um, David will run through the key design features of the project and talk through that in particular detail. Hopefully, you'll line up a lot of tricky questions for David at the end of the presentation. Um, uh, we'll, we'll we'll briefly touch on, I guess, the project cost and funding and and the status of where it's at and where we're going. Um, and at the time, there'll be a big session for questions and answers, and we can have a sort of an open table discussion where we can jump back into any parts of the presentation and and have a look and talk you through the through the design components. Um, so. Uh, just to just to make sure we're all on the same page of where we're at. So so the treatment plant is located um, in the ACT, just over the the border. Um, behind uh, the Queen Bean Railway Station um, next to Oaks Estate. Um, it, it's upstream of Lake Burley Griffin and, and uh, we have, I guess, a, a number of large sort of development areas ar around the, the place um, and, and things to consider such as the, the, the airport. We're not too far from um, Fishwick. There's all of the Queen Bean growth areas out at Gugong and that, that is a separate network to this. So, so Gugong sewage is treated in the Gugong sewage treatment plant. Um, this, this treatment plant treats the sewage that comes from the Queen Bean Township um, and the new development areas in the South Jarrah area, all, all flows via pipes and pumps to the Queen Bean Sewage Treatment Plant via two main trunk mains, which we call the Jarrabonga trunk main and the Morisset trunk main. Um, and we do take a little bit of sewage from Oaks Estate Township itself as well and treat that. Um, why do we need a new sewage treatment plant? The treatment plant is operating beyond its capacity. The original sewage treatment plant was designed for a capacity of 34 and a half thousand people. 
um, currently servicing a median of around 45,000 with peaks of 52,000. So we need to provide more capacity to treat the, the current um, population of Queanbeyan. Um, the treatment plan is also at the end of its service life. There's components that were constructed in the 1930s still in operation on the site and, and some components of the structures that were constructed in the 1980s. The mechanical and electrical equipment are at the end of their life and do need replacement. It's a major upgrade to do anything there. Um, there's obviously also development that's occurring within Queanbeyan in, in the growing um, new land releases and also infill development that will occur in town. And our future planning estimates allow for growth of up to 75,000 um, people um, by around the 2050 mark. And, and that's what we're, we're allowing for this design. Um, we're also dealing with challenges from, I guess, the ACT EPA who provide us with a discharge license for the treatment plant. And over time, I guess that the expectation on water quality standards do change and improve. And, and we need to be, I guess, a considerate environmental polluter and, and plan to, to put out better water quality and manage that going forwards. Um, uh, we're also, you know, a modern treatment facility will improve the treatment reliability. Some of the existing treatment plant does not have any real redundancy at the moment with the flows that are coming in. The new treatment plants has opportunities to have that that redundancy and, and resilience to things, including flow volume and, and flooding that occurs around the treatment plant, that the current treatment plant, as David will highlight to you later, um, is, is impacted by flooding. Um, and, and thinking forward, we also need to consider things like climate change impacts, which the current treatment plants not have the capacity to manage. Um, so if we just have a quick look at a growth chart, I know charts can be difficult to understand um, when looking at them, but we can see there the black line at the bottom is the current capacity of the treatment plant. Um, time goes on across the page. Um, we predict that the treatment plant is currently servicing around 45,000 people with peak loads of 52 represented by the red dot up there. The blue line is, is the projected growth going forward. You can see we hit the yellow line, which is 75,000 people at around um, just before the, the 2050 um, year mark. And so that, that's what this treatment plant upgrade stage now is being proposed to treat. Um, I guess, so what is the project that we're actually going to deliver? Well, it's a, it's a new 75,000 um, person treatment plant on the existing site. Um, that, that came from the master planning that was done earlier in the project phase that identified the solution, the best solution being build a new treatment plant on the existing site. The treatment plant is being designed to be modern, robust, reliable and sustainable. And David's going to touch on all of these things when he talks you through the treatment process that's being proposed. The, the design um, is targeting an excellent ISC sustainability rating. That's the Infrastructure Sustainability Council. This is part of one of council's policies that, that new buildings and infrastructure need to achieve a sustainability rating. And we're hoping to achieve that in design and as built, and we are on track to achieve that for the detailed design. Um, the project also includes a number of supporting infrastructure that will support the new treatment plan on the site, which includes power supply upgrades, um, potable water main upgrades, and an upgrade to the um, mountain road, which provides access to the treatment plant. I'll now hand over to David to run through um, the design components of the project. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Um, look, I'd like to uh, spend a little bit of time. I'll quickly explain to you a little bit about what a, a, a wastewater treatment plant does. And I'm also going to show you um, some of the, like a bit of a, like a, a bit of a video of, of the 3D model of the sewage treatment plant. So you get an idea of the scale of the project that we're talking about. But in doing this, I'm going to try and um, talk to you about this information in a way that's very much focused on, on the matters that are important for this particular treatment plant and this particular location in Queanbeyan. So this, this chart uh, in front of us um, is, a, is just a graphical summary of, of everything that, that's, that happens in this main treatment of, of wastewater. And I guess for anyone who might be joining us um, online or watching this video later, um, and it just has a bit of an interest in, in, in how that, how, you know, when we flush the toilet, we all take it for granted and, and we should, we should be able to take it for, for granted. But it's important that we have treatment that, you know, protects public health and protects the environment. 
And so this treatment system, it provides um, screening. So everything that, that's received at the works gets goes through very fine screens. They're like um, four millimeter sort of uh, like diameter holes. So everything, um, you know, like bits of paper or rag gets sort of screened out. We have a process that removes grit. So like sand that sort of gets washed into the sewer or gets settled out and then removed. And we, that's so that the, the grit doesn't really damage any of the downstream mechanical plant. This main sort of box here that's called activated sludge nutrient removal was one of the fantastic innovations, uh, breakthroughs in wastewater treatment that occurred about 1915, you know, in the UK where they really realised how to greatly improve uh, the way that wastewater is treated. And the, the soluble wastewater just sort of comes into this tank. It's full of like an activated sludge, which is a, a biomass that grows in the same way as if you have ever made yogurt at home. You get bacteria, it grows, it grows yogurt. This stuff just grows on, on pollutants. And it's fantastic because it soaks those pollutants up. It breaks things down. And the key things that we remove there is the nutrients. So we're removing things like nitrogen and phosphorus, things that um, when they get into waterways cause algal blooms. So that, that's the, the real, I guess, I, I like to say that's where the magic happens in, in wastewater treatment is there. For this particular plant, we're actually providing really advanced um, tertiary treatment. So after, after the settling in these, these clarifiers, the, all that water then goes through filters. It's going through these deep sand filters. Um, and the reason they're doing that is, is it really removes any other sort of you know, suspended solids. It drives the phosphorus levels down uh, to a very, very low. Um, and the reason we're doing that is really because we're trying to target um, as far as possible to um, you know, not, not promote any sort of further algal growth in, in the waterways that we're, we're discharging to. So we've got um, the activated sludge, which is removing a lot of the nutrients. We've got the filters, which are taking out any other particulate uh, phosphorus. And then following that, we get UV disinfection. Um, and the, the disinfection here is really just uh, so that the, the water is disinfected enough so that it can go into like the long glow and we know that there's people who swim in the you know in in the lake burley griffin there's you know uh, so it's really to provide disinfection for that sort of level of contact um, in the context of, of queenbian too the the things that were really important uh, in early consultation that we had with the community was concern about um, you know current you know wastewater coming into the plant and bypassing treatment one of the features of our existing treatment plan is that it has a limited hydraulic capacity. And so when flows arrive uh, in, in very much like wet weather, storm flow situations, that treatment facility can become overloaded and can bypass. And so you don't get the full amount of treatment. So one of the things we've incorporated into this design is uh, a wet weather storage pond, a storm pond that captures that flow, contains that flow, and then allows us to return, you know, the, the sewage to the treatment processes as, as the storm passes. So that's the real key feature that we've included. Um, I've already said we've targeted uh, bringing the phosphorus concentrations very low, but in doing that as well, we've thought about actually recovering phosphorus, like by using biological phosphorus removal, so that it remains um, available for agriculture. So that it, the the phosphorus ends up in our sludge, which we call biosolids, but those biosolids, if you put them in agriculture, those, those nutrients would be available for you know, plants to, to grow. They wouldn't be like chemically bound and um, you know, lost because phosphorus is a, like a limited resource. The only other thing I guess, I, key thing I'd sort of highlight here is we are producing like a very high quality of water and it's, it's also making the plant recycled water ready so this, this, this level of treatment is, is, you know, at a high standard and um, at a future stage, there'll be some like, extra like processes that you'd need to add, but everything we're doing here is setting ourselves up so that we can do that at a later stage. I'll just next um, talk you, take you through like a short video of, of what this all looks like. Um, because we're not marketing, we re resisted the urge to have like backing music on this. But as you can see, we're sort of coming in 
for those people who know the area, this is Mountain Road. You can see in, in the foreground. In the background, you can see the Molongai River sort of looping around the site, and there's the existing sewage treatment plant and um, maturation ponds. This view is uh, looking sort of north and gives you an idea of the scale that we're talking. This is, this is a large infrastructure project. So we're constructing large water retaining tanks to do the treatment. We have buildings to house, um, you know, equipment. We have, uh, you know, some of them are quite large, like this is like quite a large shed. Um, and then we have our, our discharge, you can see here on the riverbank. As you come into the treatment plant, and I might just pause quickly there, this first little area is um, an area that, that sort of has a separate uh, security standard to, to the others. So um, people who, uh, or council trucks and, and um, contractors that, that access this area would get to do things like this, this tank in front of you is like a recycled water fill point. So council will have the, the facility to have uh, road tankers that they're using for things like dust suppression and use recycled water from the treatment plant to, you know, for those uses. Um, this area also has, uh, you know, area where the, the, the trucks would come in and out for, for biosolids removal. So this sort of just limits the, um, the amount of like traffic that's moving around in the main treatment plant area. As we move further into the treatment plant, um, there's you know a second access gate, and you can see this building here. This is the main like amenities building that would have the, all the controls like uh, for the treatment plant. So a lot of these things like now you can control through like um, SCADA computers um, and and a PLC system. There's also workshop areas to keep you know uh, all the critical spares that they need. Now we're moving into the treatment process itself. And, and this is the first area. So this is where like wastewater is received and everything receives, you know, fine screening, as I said. But, so this area here uh, receives wastewater and screens it. This next treatment process is the grit settlement. So it's removing all the grit from the wastewater. And then the um, the, the sort of screened and degridded wastewater then goes into this very large tanks, which is the, the, the bioreactors. So this is where um, the, the biomass grows, it's aerated, it removes a lot of the nutrients, it removes like the nitrogen, the phosphorus, um, and a lot of the other pollutants sort of, you know, get attached to the solids in this, you know, in that, in that biomass. And then as the process moves, moves through, these very large circular tanks are, are big settling tanks. So they let all the solids settle out. And so you end up with this clear effluent flying over the top. And at the back end of this treatment uh, plant is, this is what we'd call tertiary treatment. It's a very high level of treatment. We have like a filtration building here. This is a filtration building. And then we have um, some, some clear water storage tanks, UV disinfection uh, facility there. And our discharge is, you know, an on-bank discharge facility here, which provides a bit, bit of like flood protection. This is a uh, giving you a bit more detail of like how uh, in depth these. This is the, the filtration system. So um, that area, let's, let's not go back to the start. That area, the filtration system is providing you with the. Um, they've got very deep filters and they, they provide um, removal of all those very fine particulate solids that we're talking about. And this last area I was going to show you here is um, a bit more of uh, around the front entry of the plant that I was talking about. So you can see we've got like um, dedicated sort of chemical storage for um, all the chemicals that we need for, for providing treatment to the wastewater. And we also have truck loading facilities for the you know, outloading of, of the final sludge product, the biosolids product. Um, so those, that, that uh, solid material goes through like a, a process called digestion. It becomes stabilised in the same way as you stabilise your kitchen waste through composting. So I've got a very stabilised waste that then gets dewatered and loaded directly into truck bodies um, and can be, can be taken. Um, currently would be taking those to, to landfill as the, the current... Um, you know, as, as per the current operation.
But if the market grew um, and there were opportunities, there is opportunity for reusing those biosolids like in agriculture. So look, I, I think that's a, a very much a, a whirlwind tour of, of how wastewater is treated. Um, but as you can see, the, the treatment process takes up quite a large footprint on the existing site. Um, you can sort of see in the background there is the existing maturation ponds, the existing sewage treatment plant. Um, if we look at that location, I guess, in the context of flooding, um, one, of the, one of the things we did early on in the project was to get this flood map. And this is showing you the extents of the, the one in 100 and the one in 200 sort of year floods. Um, and what it very clearly showed to us as designers was, well, firstly, the existing sewage treatment plant is, is flood affected. And um, in the event of like a, you know, one in a hundred year flood or, or a higher flood than that, there's, there's risk of sort of um, losing the process, um, but also infrastructure damage. And so in taking this investment from, from Queen Bien in, in this new infrastructure, we're being very careful to locate um, that, that new build, you know, in an area that was more resilient and, and was outside that flood zone. Um, as well as flooding, we also, as designers these days, consider a whole range of um, different lenses, you know, in terms of sustainability and the way that we design things. With, with wastewater design, one of the most important things is energy. Um, energy is an ongoing cost for, for the operators and so for the community um, in, 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 in how much energy you need to, it takes a lot of energy to pump and to, to treat uh, wastewater. So we've, we've um, thought very carefully in terms of the way we specify low energy um, and very energy efficient you know, equipment where we can. And we've got energy standards in, in, in the way that we've like, uh, selected our equipment. Um, and we've also applied some innovation to sort of reduce you know, energy where we could. Um, as part of this, this project, because it's a very modern facility, there's now um, power monitors that are you know, the same way as you might have if you've got like solar in your home, you can sort of see how your electricity is being used. Um, this facility would have that on all sorts of different equipment so that someone can very quickly see if, if something's sort of not operating correctly, if it's using more power than it should. So we've, we've put a good focus on energy. In terms of materials, we also, I guess one of the key message here is we recognise that this is a big investment um, for Queanbeyan and for the, for the community. And so the way that this plant is designed is, is not only thinking about that um, capacity that, that Simon showed you on the graph that, that sort of said 75,000. We've also thought, what's the next generation after this? Where is the, where is the next upgrade going to, to, to happen? So that this has been designed so that we can actually add on to this treatment process so that the next generation upgrade is not the same big step up as this one is. It's, it's an add on and we can, there's smaller, smaller upgrades that can be done to add, add capacity if it's needed, if, if growth occurred faster than, than was thought or, um, you know, or if, if it just gets to that end of, you know, that next design horizon. One of the, the other things, I guess, beyond the, the treatment plant um, that I've been talking about, the project also includes um, decommissioning the existing plant. So the existing treatment plant, you can see in this landscape plan, um, you know, is here with these, these triangles, these are sludge lagoons. Um, and then down further, further down the bank, there's the original treatment plant. So the, following the construction of, of the new, new treatment facility, there'd be a, a very well managed and staged sort of transfer um, of the treatment. We maintain, you know, treatment reliability throughout that whole process. So it's done very carefully. There's a cutover from the old facility to the new. And then there's an opportunity to like clean out that, those existing, um, the existing sewage treatment plant and, and decommission it, make it safe. Um, as part of this project, I guess, from an environmental perspective as well, we um, uh, wanted to, uh, as part of the landscaping, was to give some consideration to the riparian area, like adjacent to the, to the Monglo River. Um, and so there's a, a planting plan in place uh, to, to, you know, plant out that area with native plants. Um, and also 
while we um, are not keeping the existing maturation ponds because um, there's, there's, a, there's a range of reasons. One of the main reasons is they're in that flood prone area and we need to be careful about managing, you know, any um, pollutant that have, have accumulated in those, those ponds over, over many years of use. So during the decommissioning process, um, a lot of that sludge is going to be removed. The ponds will be infilled and made safe. Um, but we do want to, I, we are giving some consideration, I guess, to the riparian corridor, um, planting that out and also incorporating in that uh, corridor, you know, uh, stormwater sort of detention areas so that, um, you know, there is still an opportunity for water to be sort of detained, um, you know, within those areas and, and, and so that there's, still some sort of, you know, there's ecological value with water. Simon, back, back to you. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, so I guess quickly touching on on the project cost and funding. So it's um, in 2023, the project cost estimate was $182 million. And uh, Council, um, at the same time as deliver, or developing the design of the project, is working on an integrated water cycle management plan for the Queanbeyan sewer network. That is essentially our financial management plan. Um, the, the, the IWCM and the QSDP upgrade project go hand in hand together because the QSDP has such a big impact on the financial position um, of the sewer fund. And I guess um, just wanted to highlight that work on the IWCM is ongoing. The draft business case was based on the draft IWCM and that IWCM work um, hopefully will be finalized soon and new modeling will be, be coming out shortly. Um, for the funding of the project um, in terms of where the project's at and, and where we're going. So I guess um, that the first major thing was done in 2016, which was the master plan. We then um, completed the concept design in 2020, the business case in 2023, and we're currently working through the detailed design of the project. We have been working on the design for the last three or four years. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a long, slow process made slower by the planning approvals, which um, have been progressing in parallel with the design. Um, the in environmental impact statement was completed in draft in 2020, um, approved in the middle of last year by the ACT government. And we since have submitted a development application with ACT government at the end of last year that's currently been assessed by them. We have received a number of um, submissions on the development application um, from both um, the public and ACT government entities. And we're currently responding to those and hoping to respond to those in the next couple of months and, and hopefully um, have a DA approval later this year. Um, assuming that all goes ahead and I guess council um, gives us approval to go ahead and build the new treatment plan in their funding. Um, then in 2025, we hope to proceed um, to engage a contractor to construct the treatment plant. We're looking at about two and a half years for construction. Um, hopefully in two years, we have a new treatment plant that, that's built um, commissioned, we switch over from the old treatment plant to the new treatment plant. We then have around six months of um, demolition of the old treatment plant and, and the massive earthworks to remove the ponds and, and revegetate that area. And, and then hopefully in 2027, we have um, a fully completed project. Um, so I guess now we'd like to move into the, uh, the question time of, of the session. Um, again, I'd like to mention if you um, the questions and discussion at the moment will be recorded. If you, if you did want to ask a question unrecorded, just please wait till the end and we'll let you know when the recording has finished. Um, in advance of the end, thank you all for listening to the presentation. Um, as mentioned, a recording of the presentation will be available on the project website um, on the QPRC, which is accessible via the QPRC website. Um, I guess I'll open the floor to any questions and please remember to use your, your microphones um, so that the recording can hear you. Uh, right. yeah, uh, Tom Baker, Queen Bee and Landcare. One eighty two million dollars. Does that include the uh, subsequent upgrade of the sewage treatment network? Uh, I guess so so the whole the whole um, capital works program for the sewage treatment network is considered in the integrated water cycle management planning. So the one hundred and eighty two million dollars is for the treatment plant only. That cost does include, um, an upgrade to the Morissette trunk main that's located on the Queanbeyan sewage treatment plant site and an extension of the Jerobromba trunk main to the new inlet works. But other works for upgrading the network are considered in, in the IWCM and costed in that.
No one else wants to ask a question. No one oh, Sorry. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm just intrigued as to whether there's any sort of contingency plan, considering this isn't going to be done until 2027. And you've spoken about the population that it was designed for, 34,000-odd people, and we're now, what, to about 54. So are there any contingency plans if the treatment works actually fails? It's a tricky one. It's a tricky one. Um, we will continue to operate and maintain the plant. We're on the existing plant. We're spending. We're still spending money on things. We've got some money in the next year's budget to do works on something that we're going to abandon in three or four years. But as an operational reason, we can't not do it. So there is there is works that we will have to do in the meantime to keep the plant running. Um, we just work harder as well at the plant. In in some respects, we've just got to make the plant work harder. So we're upgrading, replacing things. There's a few things that are well and truly beyond the end of life. And we've just bitten the bullet and said we've got to start doing stuff at the plant. I, I guess I'd, I'd just add to that answer to say from a wastewater designer perspective, we've we've actually looked very hard um, for for solutions, and, and there, there's there's no there's no easy quick fix solutions here. Um, there's there's there are no uh, obvious sort of bolt on treatment, you know, stages that 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 Queanbeyan could invest in that would not just be abandoned, you know, um, investment because uh, to to provide the treatment capacity that we we actually need. You you really need to build that big structure, which is, which is the bioreactor. Like it's it's that's that's the piece that's missing. Like at the the um, the reactors now uh, at the existing treatment plant, those tanks they're just too small. So uh, and and so it, because you're talking about like the volume in concrete, you know it's it, it's it's not an easy thing to fix. Yeah. We talked about tertiary level treatment of yeah. the plant. I mean, I'm, I mean, could you just explain this? I was, what I'm concerned about is drugs and, and antibiotics and all that sort of stuff that ends up in the, the, the waste. I assume that this process is still with all of that adequately. Yeah, look, um, and I'll be, uh, you know, uh, straight up and down about this, the like what what you're talking about, we would call sort of emerging contaminants. Yeah. So, uh, in the last sort of you know ten or fifteen years, we've um, really become uh, as as wastewater sort of treatment industry um, more aware of the the impact of things like you know um, personal care products um, and also microplastics and also pharmaceuticals. So. Um, when you use like um, drugs and medicine, those those pharmaceuticals pass through you and they pass into wastewater, and a wastewater plant like receives all those. Um, the treatment facility that we're providing, um, it has that very large uh, tank. I keep talking about where the, the 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 magic happens, the bioreactor. What we've adopted when we when we did our our selection, we adopted uh, a a large reactor with something called a, a long residence time, like a long sludge residence time or solids residence time. And that means that the um, the, the, the biomass that's there, like it, it absorbs those pollutants, those things like pharmaceuticals, and they stay in the process for a longer time than other processes that we had available. So with that longer time, that process has the best chance of degrading um, as many of those pollutants as 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 you know as possible. The the science we have shows that um, with pharmaceutical products, there are there's a broad range of different sort of um, medicines and and drugs that, that that arrive in wastewater. This process provides the best chance for degrading all of you know as many of those as possible. There are some that we know that that just go through, and so they'll in, end up in wastewater and. It's because, or and end up in the receiving water, and that's just because we don't, as you know, as a civilization yet have have suitable treatment that to take those things out. Because sometimes they occur in very very small concentrations. When you think, you know, you might have a population 
Um, you know, you might have like 10 people receiving, receiving like radioactive therapy or something like that, you know, so um, the, the process we have is the best that, that we know uh, available. Um, the, the, uh, you've mentioned that pretty high quality water would be produced at the end of the process and that there would be quite a lot of that water. So I can just imagine like at the Malonglo series treatment, but there's a, like a quite a river of water running into the Murrumbidgee. So I'm just trying to imagine how much water would be flowing constantly into the Malonglo River. And the other part of the question is, how much of that can we recycle? I mean, can we, can that, that I suppose that's a whole new exercise to pump that back into the town again, isn't it? That's completely different exercise. Yes, yes, it is. Like um, two, two great questions. The, the, the first one, um, how much would we be di discharging to the Malongolo? Um, I would start by answering to say it, it follows growth. It follows like population growth. Um, and so if you, if you go to the, those figures, you sort of say, look, we're at 50,000 now, roughly, and we're going to 75,000. So it's like a, it's a 50% increase on what we're currently doing. So the, the, the existing discharge is sort of already discharging 50,000, roughly. Um, we're sort of going like a 50% increase over that. In a, a dry period, the, the Malongolo there, um, you know, nearly stops flowing. Um, and so the, you know, the, that discharge, you know, provides a little bit of flow. Um, in a wet period, that, that the amount that we're discharging is a very small portion compared to the amount of flows that come down the river. So it really does depend on river conditions. But the, um, I guess the, in, in, if you're thinking about the quantums of, of discharge, the amount that, 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 that increase of 50%, you know, in terms of the overall flow of the Malongolo isn't such a big increase in flows. Going to your question about recycling, um, the and, and, and as I was talking about before, with the tertiary treatment, this is very high quality water that we are producing and we're producing it for an environmental reason. We're at, that's, that's the main driver is because we're, 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 we're trying to get the phosphorus out and make sure we, we know we're being um, very careful about algal blooms. But that all sets this plant up to, to produce recycled water, like because we've already got filtered, partially disinfected water, you'd need to um, you'd need to provide further chlorine contact, and and so there'd be like some more chemical dosing and and a tank to to make sure there's enough disinfection for chlor with chlorine, um, but then that would be suitable for you know a greater range of recycled water uses, such as you know um, irrigating parks and gardens, or or you know even you know a third pipe system. But those things with, I guess, one of the barriers to that is you need a use. Um, and that's that's the key barrier I, uh, as well as cost for, for, for the Queanbeyan community. It, it, it's easier to have a recycled water scheme when you're, um, you know, in a, got a, like an agricultural setting around you and you can, you know, you've got cotton farms or, or something like that that take a lot of water and don't need a high quality. Um, everything we're, we're doing in this upgrade sets the stage and, and, and enables that to happen. But you're right um, in saying that there's quite an investment in actual the pipes, the, the, you know, investing in pipes to, to, to go back and to, to set up that scheme. There's, there's a whole, you know, another step of investment that would need to be happening to do that. And then there's ongoing sort of monitoring and, and management of those systems. So we've set everything else up, for, you know, so that can happen. Um, but it isn't like that would be like a, a, another step. Can I just ask David, following from Tom's question, you asked about the water flow and you said 50,000 versus 75. Mm -hmm. What is the actual quantum of water? Like in terms of gigalitres, megalitres, what goes into the Malongo now every day? And when we have 75,000 people, what will go in next? Yeah, so the current, current uh, discharge ranges between sort of eight megalitres a day up to sort of 12 for most days. And then we get storm flows. For example, if we get as much rain as we think we're going to get this weekend, we'll probably get towards 20 megalitres a day. Um, and we'll get that for several days. Um, so that's that's sort of current. And then if we're going, if we just pro rata that up, we're probably looking at 
18 megalitres, something like that a day that will be discharged from the site in most days. And I guess if we add to the discussion on flows, um, the, the new treatment plant at, at its 75,000 um, EP capacity is designed to treat around 17 megalitres of water a day. And if you think about the treatment capacity we're allowing for, the treatment plant is designed to treat up to five and a half times that amount through the treatment process itself, which is far beyond what I understand treatment plants are typically designed to treat. And we have a storm pond that can hold temporarily up to nine times the average dry weather flow without discharging to the creek. So we've got huge capacities being able to be treated through the treatment plant and put out that, that better quality water into the river. Can I just ask the biosolids, David, you said could be used for agriculture maybe one day. Are there standards or um, will it be treated to a standard that they are acceptable or is it because the agricultural sector hasn't got standards yet that that can be used in agriculture yet? Yeah, it's a, it's a changing field at the moment. Um, so since about the mid nineties, there's been a, like a, a biosolids reuse uh, guideline that's been published by the EPA. Um, so at the moment there are uh, like guidelines that are, that are in place. It would need to be sort of a managed scheme. You can't just, um, you know, pass this out to any, any farm. There needs to be like on site, a bit of a site assessment and then some ongoing monitoring to check that, um, you know, none of the um, pollutants that are still in the biosolids sort of, you know, leach into the environment. Um, I've actually seen some of these farms up at like Cassless. So um, I'm from Newcastle and Hunter Water take their biosolids up there. And um, I've, I've sort of walked around with farmers um, and they're very positive about the use of biosolids. If you're in, a, in an area where there's, um, you know, you're far enough from residents that odour is not a concern, um, they've found that it sort of improves the soil conditioning um, and, you know, the, the water retention in the soil. Um, you get a bit more organic, um, you know, growth in, in your soil. Uh, you know, if you go and sort of pull up a clot of grass in one of these plots, you can just see it's rich with earthworms. So um, it, it's, it is a, um, there are guidelines in place. It is beneficial. We know that. Um, one of the constraints on Queen Bin is, is the, the volumes produced. They're, they're probably not enough um, to, you know, you, you, you'd need to sort of advertise and find out if there was a market that would actually take that. I think to add to that, and David, correct me if I'm wrong, one product that we could produce from the treatment plant, given that we're, we're aspiring to achieve enhanced, or I guess, biological phosphorus removal um, is, 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 a, is a, I guess, a, a phosphorus rich lime product that's used to settle phosphorus out of the water returning from the waste stream when when it's when the sludge is dewatered and that could be processed separately if we had a market to take that product separate to the sludge or we can mix them together to produce the phosphorus rich sludge that's that's bioavailable but but it is it is an operational um you know an operational thing that that queen bin would need, need to take on like is, is actually engaging um you know, through an expression of interest or something, getting interested parties, but then sort of managing those. What's important is there's lots of options for us in the future with this new treatment plan. Um, you said this biomass was going to landfill. Where exactly? Uh, so it would likely go to Woodlawn at the moment. We would right. need to go through a tender process to do it, but currently right. that's where um, general waste collected within the QPRC region splits to two areas. Right. Within Queanbeyan, it goes into Mugger Lane mm. and outside of Queanbeyan, Queanbeyan being Jarrah, Google mm. as well. Um, outside of those areas, it goes to Woodlawn. Right. What if that doesn't happen? I mean, can it be incinerated? It, it could be, like it'd be expensive because a lot of, um, even though we've we've um, you know thickened this stuff and dewatered it, it's still only fourteen percent solids, or you know mm. up to say sort of twenty percent solids. There's a lot of eighty percent of it's water. Mm. So if you're starting to talk about incineration, um, you know it's not autothermal. Like they need to sort of um, you know add fuel to those sort of things. Mm. So um, the the standard um, sort of disposal routes for for that for biosolids um, across New South Wales is, is landfill. 
um, and where their scale permits, um, you know, it's agricultural reuse. Mm. But but um, even that's sort of a changing field as people, be, um, you know, more awareness and more science comes out about some of the pollutants. There's there's um, discussion about those biosolids reuse guidelines changing and becoming more more stringent. So it, it, it is something that needs to be, you know, managed within the um, the guidelines that we have and the regulations that we have. Can I just, um, just ask a little question on behalf of Queenbee and Landcare? Some of our members mm -hmm. are concerned about the, the fact that the maturation ponds are going to go, and mm -hmm. you explained that that was because of flooding, which I understand, and alluded to some other reasons. Can you give me a few more so I can let our members know why we're losing that bird habitat. But obviously... Uh, yeah, 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 just jump in on the front end of that, I guess, yeah. that for us, one of the, the key, like, I guess, as one of our commitments under the Infrastructure Sustainability Council rates, and we're committed to a number of design elements of the project that would we would involve, um, I guess, stakeholders in, and the landscape design was one of those features that we involved um, stakeholders in, and I, I Queen Bee and Land Care as well as a number of other stakeholders, the ornithologist group in Canberra, Canberra Airport, and, and others were involved in, in a group that, that I guess we ran a number of workshops on what it is we could design um, and, and, and what, what do we need to consider? Um, and I guess we went away, our designers came up with a landscape design that went back out for comment. We've ended up with what we've got, <laughs> which I know doesn't uh, address your questions there, but I guess David can touch on, I guess, some of the, the reasons as to why we've got what we've got. And look, I was just going to um, sort of declare before I started on on the third watcher. Um, <laughs> so no conflict of interest here. Um, look, I guess one of the the maturation ponds as they are are a bit of an issue for ongoing management um, for 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 Queen Bin. Um, so these maturation ponds have been in use for for many years, and they're likely to have like accumulated like a, a fair amount of the sludge. Um, produced by the process. So the treatment plan has become overloaded. Um, and, and as part of that, it, it can no, because it's over capacity, it can no longer contain all the solids, um, you know, during wet weather flows. And those solids are sort of washing into the maturation ponds. Um, and they have done over, you know, many years. So we're imagining um, those maturation ponds are, are, are are full of, of um, you know, sludge that's accumulated and degraded over time. A lot of the biological content of that sludge is not really an issue for anyone. It, it would have sort of degraded over time. But, um, you know, there's trace chemicals and, and things like heavy metals um, that you'd expect um, that it's received in wastewater that's, that ends up in, in those solids. So um, one thing is, is dealing with all the sludge from those. Um, the second thing is that the maturation ponds themselves, um, you know, they're at the end of their service life and they're, they're, they're exposed to flooding. And so they've um, sort of been damaged over time. Um, and the ponds themselves, like, you know, from a structural, um, you know, perspective, um, would also need work to, to, you know, maintain their sort of structural integrity. Um, so rather than having sort of water retaining structures that, um, you know, potentially have the sludge within them, um, we've taken a measure to, um, you know, to actually, as part of the landscaping, to sort of infill those and to, to, to mitigate those, those issues, to mitigate the issue of having things like, you know, ponds which um, are at risk, you know, should a, a, like a large flood come through, you could lose a, like a pond embankment and, and then you, you just lose whatever contents are in that pond. Um, you know, to the Malongolay River. And, and this has happened in the past, you know, at Queanbeyan. Um, so to deal with that risk, um, we took the decision to, um, you know, to have them infilled as part of the landscaping. Um, that also, uh, one of our stakeholders, Canberra Airport, was quite um, pleased with that outcome because for the operation at Canberra Airport, um, large water bodies attract, you know, large waterfowl, that are, that are sort of bigger bigger birds and present a, like a higher sort of risk of bird strike. Um, so we've dealt with those issues, but in, in doing that, you know, we, we still had that view of trying to um, consider this in terms of the ecological corridor and the riparian zone. Um, and so we have aimed for like native planting um, and we have aimed for, um, you know, having some stormwater detention areas, you know, maybe planted out with reeds 
so that it, it could potentially attract some of the smaller bird bird life. Um, working with um, you know the airport, they're not so concerned with these smaller birds. So if you're th talking about things like um, crates and rails um, and potentially Latham snipe, which is in the area, um, those type of birds don't need large you know open water bodies, but would still be sort of attracted to you know these sort of stormwater detention basins. So that um, we're trying to balance, you know, removing these risks while still sort of maintaining the ecological value of, you know, what is like river riparian. I might just add that there's also a regulatory burden that comes with those maturation ponds in their current form. So they are actually listed dams in the ACT. So they bring away not quite the same level of requirements, but they sit in the same category as Gugong Dam, as Captain's Flat Dam. So very serious large dams, these maturation ponds get treated in a similar method there. So there is a reasonable expense to council and then to rate payers in managing those dams, those ponds as dams. It's in the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to keep them there. Can I ask Simon or David, are there any solar panels or renewable energy sources? Um, at, at the moment, I guess we're, we're, we're allowing, so, so no, there's no, no solar panels on the site. Um, we, we're allowing in the electrical design for a connection point, um, for solar, should that be, um, considered in the future, but we haven't designed it there at the moment. We need, I guess, um, the, the plant is, is powered in the ACT, the ACT government provides, I guess, 100% renewable energy supply, um, in, in their network. So I guess the plant's powered by renewable energy um completely um from from the get-go any any on solar on site would just be us offsetting our, our expenses yeah i i'd add to that to say i guess two things one is following the the decommissioning of the existing sewage treatment plant that'll land that that'll free up a bit more land area um and that might also be an opportunity for for queen bin to revisit um, like a, a bit of an assessment about um, solar panels. Um, working with other utilities sort of across the state, um, we find that, you know, you, you certainly get better generation if you're able to, if you've got space for sort of on-ground panels. So there's this sort of, you know, easier maintenance and also, you know, just larger areas for, for, for installing panels. So you've got more generating capacity and the payback is excellent because uh, the wastewater treatment plant generates or uses its power during those same periods of day as like a, any solar generation that you can install will 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 put on so you you would you have very very good payback it's it's well worth um looking at that again great so are the sheds engineered so solar panels could go on the roofs in as an initial as well as then looking at you know future the, the sheds um, are engineered with roofs that, that could have solar panels on, yes, and, and the buildings, yep. I think just with, with the site as well, I guess we've got a large flood impacted area, so it'd be, we'd be looking to avoid those areas with any solar panel infrastructure. Um, a part of the site is allocated as future expansion of the existing treatment plants. So we want to keep that, that area of the site nice and clear, but there is a large area of the site that we'll be using for part of the construction operation. There's a huge amount of earthworks that will be shifted around the site and, and I guess that that's probably a very large pad that could be looked at um, for an on-ground solution in the future. The, all the power lines. Yeah, it looks like there's a lot of land, but when you stand there and you look around and you go, there are a lot of power easements across this land. So you you lose that big triangle that sort of sits to the south effectively. I think um, that the, the airport also presents issues with, with solar panels and reflection. I think there are methods to consider that in the design, but that would be something that could need to be considered as well. Queen and Landcare uh, put in a submission for the development application. And uh, what we were talking about was looking a little bit more expansively about a, a more regional collaboration approach, given that Canberra's downstream of Queanbeyan and, you know, places like Hume and the Hume being next to South Jurabomba and all that, just a few yards away, um, without going into my into our submission, um, is it possible 
is it possible a little bit of lateral thinking there? Can if it, if it is such a good plant, can it, for instance, use some of the ACTs, uh, effluent from fish week or uh, uh, um, Hume? I mean, is there any potential there for collaboration there, and and there and there that would alleviate the cost to some extent, and until the lowest. Malong low series treatment work is upgraded because that's going to be upgraded and that could actually in the end do everyone's but that's another story i think from a from a capacity perspective um if we were taking on more capacity we'd need to, to allow for for more volume or i guess a, a bigger treatment plant um from a discharge license perspective um with the new treatment plant will come a new discharge license that's likely to be a lot more constrained in what we can discharge um, a lot of the New South Wales licences include flow limits as well. We may see that in our new licence. So I guess um, the impacts of additional flows from our treatment plant discharged into the river, the impacts of those flows on Lake Burley Goofin would all need to be considered um, uh, with, with with expanding, the, the I guess, the effluent from the current treatment plant. Um, I guess uh, the regional um, options were looked at earlier um, with Icon Water. Um, Rebecca, I don't know if you want to touch on um, sort of where we're at with, with those conversations at the moment. So, Tom, thanks for your question. And you missed my start when I said we weren't going to be discussing that area of the of the project. But, but yes, there was the Best for the Region um, investigation, which finished in 2016, as 20, I understand. Uh, yeah, 2018, 2018. I think. Um, I've had conversations that, you know, that... I don't think that's an option. We'll explore that just to make sure that council is satisfied that we have explored it. Um, I don't believe now is the time to be doing it or changing this project for that. Um, that would, I think that would put us back another five or 10 years of where we're at, at now. I, I guess I'd just add to that answer from a, like a, a different perspective, which is if we, if we've built this treatment plan or once you build this treatment plant, you've got that certain amount of headspace between, um, you know, what the current, what the connection load is and, 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 you know, what the design capacity is. And so if you took the, um, you know, like if, if a view was taken to take the, the wastewater from Fishwick, what that actually do is it would, it would eat into that headspace and it would mean that the, the, the treatment plant, the new treatment plant would reach its capacity uh, you know, at, at an, an earlier date. Um, and so that that sort of, um, you know, instead of this plant, you know, um, you know, maybe having a lifetime out to sort of 2050 or, or there, you know, you know, you'd be looking at another upgrade earlier. Like, so you don't, you know, like you don't get anything for nothing really. Um, it's the same, the same logic applies if you, you think about, um, you know, as a thought exercise, what if we transferred this wastewater to, you know, to Icon Water and Lower Malongolo? The same applies. So um, Icon Water have a, a whole, you know, capital upgrade program of all their networks and pump stations and and their their treatment plant. They're they're planning, um, you know, and designing an upgrade of Lower Malongolo at the moment. If if suddenly they're dealing with all of Queanbeyan's wastewater, those all that all that all that wastewater needs to be conveyed, which is first. So you'd need to like there's a whole capital upgrade program of of uh, designing and building all those pipes and pump stations, but then uh, treating it at, at the end. Like and 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 the cost of all that, you know, uh, still needs to be borne by the by you know the people who contribute to the, the sewer systems. So like I think you know both of those you know argument or both of those thoughts um you know they're, they're worth some consideration but the, there's 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 costs associated with with all of these things you know the if if we if we're discharging sewage we need to convey it we need to treat it and it's you know it, the, those costs don't go away if you you know you you move it somewhere else so you know, um, yeah go on Often uh, during an, an infrastructure project, the users are affected. So you know, during a road upgrade, for example, um, uh, uh, traffic is slowed down and motors are disrupted otherwise. I'm hoping you can, you can tell me that residents won't have similar disruptions. Uh, I guess the sewer doesn't stop flowing, you're right, and, and it's our job to make sure. So I guess from a, from a construction staging point of view, um, we need to keep operating the existing treatment plant until the new treatment plant is constructed 
and tested and operational and 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 there comes the day when when we 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 switch the pipes over and david can maybe talk through that process at, at, a, at a little bit of a higher level but but we do have a, a plan for how that process happens but and, and so i guess you keep flushing your toilets it keeps going down the pipes and, and we're, we're we're dealing with it in a process that that doesn't affect you <laughs> and look i think that's the short answer is that um as part of that whole planning process we we, we plan on the basis that the, the wastewater just keeps coming um and that, that everything is worked around that so uh, it, it it's quite an exciting time for like a, a new treatment plant. You know the, the the cutover process. It's very well planned out. Um, there's a lot of contingency thinking that goes in, um, and there's probably like a lot of work at night. That you know the cutover process itself um, is probably something that you schedule for you know two a.m. four a.m. because that's when flows are lowest. Yeah, I guess the network has pump stations with 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 storage yeah, capacities with them, so everything everything will might might back up for a little bit, and and yes, we'll we... but but not in a way that anyone would notice. No, right? yeah. So yeah, yeah. There's there's storage in the network that sort of you know stores things up. Yeah. There's one of the slides after that. I think it was Simon. It had the map of the like the process, and you you talked about aerobic digestion. Mm. Is there what's the difference, or is there any benefit, or of looking at an, an anaerobic digestion system? Thank you. Um, so yes, look, the uh, like I guess the one of, I get the, the the short answer is we have looked at anaerobic digestion. So with all these processes that we're putting forward. Um, they've all been through like a, a, a very robust um, and thorough sort of option selection process where we considered all the different options. Um, we worked with, um, you know, QPRC and involved the operators. We also involved the regulators in those conversations um, to select the, you know, the preferred technology. Um, this process um, that we're talking about, aerobic digestion, it, it, it's breaking down the, the biosolids, so it breaks down the sludge, the raw sludge that's produced by the process and, and creates like a stable biosolid. So this is the one I referred to as being like composting. It's aerobic because we're putting, um, we're aerating it. So this is something that, that uses oxygen, um, the bacteria use um, oxygen. One of the benefits of, of that is that because it's aerobic it and it acts a bit like a compost, it doesn't produce odour. Like it, the, it's got that same sort of composty smell to it. It's like the, you know, like a little bit musty, but like not an objectionable odour. When you start going anaerobic, um, like there are anaerobic digesters where you put your sludge in there and, and the sludge is, is kind of black, it uses anaerobic without oxygen um, bacteria to break it down. And those bacteria form methane, um, so there's a risk there, I guess, and, and hydrogen sulfide. There's a risk there of, of, of more odour in that process, but they, they, they do contain it all. Um, and, and there's an opportunity for, um, you know, harvesting the methane and, and using it like um, as an energy source, either for like a, a, a turbine or, or something like that. When we ran the numbers for Queanbeyan, with this particular scale of treatment plant and your cold climate, um, the 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 climate is actually a little bit cold for um you know for the for the bugs to actually to keep uh self-sustaining um the the type of bugs the anaerobic bugs that that work in an anaerobic digester um they have much lower growth rates and they're a little bit more fragile than the the bugs in an aerobic digester and so they 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 want better conditions they want warmer conditions so that they can continue to operate so when we did an energy balance around that we actually found that there wasn't the same sort of um, energy yield um, from an anaerobic digester here as as you might get in in other in other parts of the world and i say other parts of the world because um, a lot of the popularity for anaerobic digesters is in the uk um, they're cold, but they are not uh, treating to the same level as we are in terms of nutrients. So we, we put all our effort into removing nitrogen and phosphorus, um, you know, in, in our bioreactors, and that takes a lot of the energy out of the sludge. And so the sludge that we're actually feeding to our digesters 
is very, very low energy content. It's, um, it's basically the, the, the cell, the outside cell walls of, of, of bacteria that have like self cannibalized themselves because they've run out of food. There, there's very, very low energy content in that, in that sludge that we're feeding. Whereas in the UK, because they're discharging to like very rough oceans and that sort of thing, they don't need to, um, you know, treat to that same standard. Their sludge has a lot more energy content when it, when it goes into the digester. And, and so there's more energy available there for, for methane generation. So yes, we've looked at this very carefully. Um, in this case, anaerobic digestion's um, not favorable. We would actually need to uh, burn most of the gas that we produce just to keep it sustained. And I've got one more. How do we know that the storm, when you have a big storm, that we're not going to get the same amount of, you know, because that's what's happened is, you know, in our grey water, we've got storm infil infiltrates that. How do we know that this is going to handle it, this new plant will handle it? Um, I want to say because we designed it to. <laughs> <laughs> But, but we designed it to in a, in a number of ways. Like, um, and and the first the first one is uh, what I'd say is our hydraulic loading is very conservative. So we actually, as designers, one of the first things we do is we say, okay, how many people do you have? And we said, oh, seventy five thousand people. And then we make an assessment of how much water are we going to allow for each, how much sewage we're we going to allow for each of those people. And so um, we've taken a conservative, like a loading for every single person. So I've, I've already, I already know that my flows are, are quite conservative. The reason we did that is because of, of some of the issues that was raised in, in feedback on the, on the DA and also on the EIS from the community, which was, look, we're concerned about, you know, what if your catchment's a bit leaky, if the pipes are a bit old, um, the pipes could leak, there's more infiltration, what if there's climate change and we get more storms? A lot of that is already factored into the design. It's already catered for. We've already allowed for that in, in, in allowing a li little bit more flow per person. So that's my starting point. My, my second point is we, we knew about this in advance. Like we know from the flow monitoring at the existing sewage treatment plant that the plant does get high flows. And so we've designed for that. This whole treatment process um, that you see here, as Simon was saying, um, is designed specifically to operate like in a normal mode. And then when the flows come, you know, get above a, a certain threshold, it, it switches to a high flow rate mode. And so it's capable of treating, you know, a higher flow of, of, of wastewater as it comes in so it doesn't accumulate. But even if that, even if that is not enough, we have that, that very large storm pond that captures the wastewater and, and then returns it. So we've We've, we've got multiple sort of, you know, belt and braces approaches to, to treating high flows of sewage because we knew that it was an issue in this particular catchment and we knew it was an issue that the community was concerned about. I guess, um, and, and it's designed for that 75,000 EP load, so that there's a lot of capacity when it first comes online that it, hopefully it, it doesn't discharge. I guess in, in time as well, um, I guess within the sewer network, there, there's things that, that happen such as relining of pipes and... And, and fixing the problems where there's known infiltration and other things that, that might help reduce that that load that comes into the treatment plant in the peak weather flows. I think as part of the EIS, we did we did some additional modelling of the inflows into the treatment plant to demonstrate how many times we expect the storm pond to be exceeded um, at the request of the SET government. That that looked back at 100 years' worth of rainfall records and, 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 and a bit of, I guess, um, and it looked back at the, the inflows historically to the plant from the 90s and, and estimated what what the response we would expect from the network coming into the treatment plant with those flows. And I, I guess that also had an allowance for climate change as well. So the, the, the assumption that, that the flows may be higher um, with the influence of climate change. And so we've looked at, at modelling to, to estimate how many times that might happen. And, you know, I, I think... I could be wrong. Three times in a hundred years. I don't know how many times it, it was exceeded, but it, it, that's not very often. Um, and and look, I I call that sort of a, like an almost an emergency overflow, and it's it because it, it is like so infrequent. Um, and we we've just designed as part of the process. You know, like if you design a system, you want it to have a fail safe, and and that's what this is. Um, 
under those sort of conditions where the storm pond was predicted to be exceeded, it was also the, the, the conditions where the Malongolo River was predicted to be in flood. So we were sort of, you know, the whole, you, you saw that that photo or that, that, that diagram that I had that had, you know, the, the treatment plant surrounded by the floodwaters. And that's really what we're talking here. Um, but before we, before we stop recording, I, I would like um, just to, to close by thanking you all once again for, um, for your time this evening. Um, I, I am um, genuinely very thankful that, that you've taken the interest in, in, in um, you know, a wastewater treatment plan upgrade. And, and thank you everyone from myself as well, the, from the, the project team. You know, I guess we, 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 we like engaging with, with stakeholders. We've done lots of these types of meetings throughout the project. It's always led to good outcomes. I think we all understand each other better and we've, we've moved forward, I think. Um, and yeah, so the, thanks for coming, Rebecca. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much. Really, really appreciate it. And Simon and everyone else, and I really thank you for your questions and um, um, listening and being part of it and engages it. Really do appreciate it. Simon is always very approachable if you think of questions later. Um, thank you very much. You can, we might stop the recording now and then say goodbye to everybody and then we can have a discussion after. Is there a celebration?